All right. Thought we could talk a little bit about Rick Beato's most recent video on Billie Eilish being the Kurt Cobain of this generation, which is based on a similar comment that Dave Grohl had made a little while ago. Now, I love Rick Beato's videos. They're amazing. He's uh, certainly a master musician, whatever that means. But um, yeah, extremely insightful videos. Um, and he has such a positive personality, he's always able to look for the good in pretty much everything. And that's admirable. Um, sometimes I think, though, certain things need to be held to a little bit of a higher standard on the artistry front, I guess. And that's where my, uh, I don't know if you call it a counter argument, um, to the points that he made in his in his Billie Eilish video comes in. He made um, quite a few very specific claims as to why Billie Eilish qualifies as being the Kurt Cobain of this generation. So just jumping right into it, we'll take a look at some of the things he had to say. Um, he played a clip of one of her songs, her newest single, I believe, um, and he commented on the uh, pleasant melody and how it's a real song with real singing, real guitar accompaniment. That all seemed to be very true, and that's fine. That's right off the bat, though, we're not setting a real high standard there. Yes, it's better than a lot of music, which doesn't uh, even attempt that sort of a thing. But there's millions of songs out there that have real singing. It's a real song doesn't necessarily make it good and certainly doesn't make it um, the sort of thing that is the most successful in the current current uh, music marketplace or worthy of that I should say depending on whether a person uh, attributes any value to what's uh, popular anyways um, but he goes on to say that she really is a rock star and he goes he finishes the video on that note as well and he elaborates on it. Um, I would say, first of all, she doesn't need to be a rock star or like a rock star. She can be her own thing. Um, I think that's to appeal to people who are looking for the next big rock star, saying, hey, she qualifies. Um, I guess it depends what you're looking for in a rock star. Um, she, her music doesn't rock at all. That would be something that personally, as someone who um, would love for there to be another uh, massive rock band, would like it to actually rock, um, which <laughs> Nirvana certainly did. Uh, but anyways, I'm getting sidetracked. He goes on to list a bunch of bullet points um, on how, the similarities between her and Kurt Cobain. He says she's rebellious. Kurt Cobain was rebellious. Uh, her lyrics discuss alienation. So did his lyrics. Clothes. They wore similar clothes I guess and then they change their image from time to time uh, both critical darlings worldwide popularity they write their own music both good singers and finally they both qualify as being the voice of their generation now the rebellious thing um, I'm not too sure about that. I mean, I'm not sure of what value that really is other than giving a background narrative to the music. Um, but her version of Rebellion versus Kurt seems uh, quite at odds with each other. He, he really was. He was kicked out of his parents' house. He was a drug addict. He... Uh, couldn't hold down a job, whereas Billie Eilish, from what I can tell, seems to follow the plan that's in place for her uh, very well. She's uh, which, which is fine, but um, I'm not sure what she's rebelling against. If in fact, it seems like everything in her life was directed towards her becoming a pop um, music, if not star, writer, producers, so on. She didn't, Certainly didn't seem to rebel against that. I don't know what it is she's rebelling against. But anyways, alienation in the lyrics. All well and good. Um, that is uh, 
pretty superficial though are the lyrics any good you could have alienation in your poetry you could be an 11 year old scribbling something on your wall or you know you could be um, Rimbaud or something like that so there's there's just because you fit in a certain category there's um, various extremes of degree of, of uh, quality in that clothes uh, doesn't really matter critical darling doesn't really matter worldwide popularity yeah also doesn't really matter this is all pretty superficial stuff writes their own music um, that's definitely worth noting he goes on to talk about how her, you know a lot of music these days is written by committee that's not really the case with her stuff it's her and her brother so um, she deserves some props for that absolutely but once again how good is this music uh, they're both good singers um, sure she seems to be a very good singer um, once again there's probably millions of good singers in the world just because you happen to be a good singer and somebody else's I don't know if that necessarily is a apples to apples comparison I don't know if you can just um, conflate the two and voice of their generation well, even at the time, I think people debated the voice of the generation thing for uh, Cobain. I think certainly he'd be the strongest contender for it. I mean, he really, he, I mean, he changed the face of modern music, the direction it was going um, in a very obvious way. Now, he was made, you know, there was a dam built up behind him that once he kind of cracked open that first uh, chunk of it, it burst forth and there was a lot of stuff waiting in the wings ready to come out, but that was there was something definitely pivotal there, whereas with Billie Eilish, she, her music just fits in with everything else that's going along right now in this sort of beige, mediocre pop landscape of Lord, Lana Del Rey, all that, and a million other, okay, maybe a million is an exaggeration, but not much indie pop moody slightly atmospheric slow to mid-tempo her stuff just fits in with all of that it's not a massive massive changing of the guard by any means it's just a continuation of what's been happening for a decade or two now got a shout out to the spotted cow there I'll uh the red letter media guys good stuff anyways um, Rick Beato goes on to talk about the uh, good production in the music this I have to completely agree with excellent production um, which is is different though than being a, a Kurt Cobain her brother Phineas and Billy herself seems to have a pretty good um, ear for um, production that is not the same thing as being a having a gift for for melody the way that uh, Kurt Cobain did amongst his many other talent things in his talent stack so yeah they're good at production they know their way around uh, digital audio workstation for sure in fact he highlights that it's very tasteful production and I would 100% agree with that and there's a lot to be said for being tasteful although that kind of flies counter to the rock star Kurt Cobain thing because a lot of his stuff was intentionally distasteful in fact the entire production of In Utero was meant to be less than tasteful um, And certainly being tasteful doesn't fit in with this idea of being rebellious either. So, um, But I agree, it is very tasteful um, with everything that that uh, engenders. I mean, it yeah, it makes for music that's easy to assimilate, but it doesn't push the envelope, doesn't demand anything of the listener, doesn't offer anything beyond to the listener, doesn't take one to any kind of sublime heights or... Um, depths of despair, chaos, yes, it's mildly moody. Um, it's about the, the most that can be said of it. 
Um, he talks about the dynamics that you know there's not a lot of uh, ludicrous compression and things like that on it. But even there, I would I would say it's relatively undynamic music, especially compared to something like Nirvana. When you think of like the first 30 seconds of Smells Like Teen Spirit, the dynamics involved in that. Um, yeah, I don't think there's it, anything in her entire uh, discography that it combined would amount to the, um, I don't know, dynamic intensity. Just in, yeah, in just the first 30 seconds or the first minute, if you get, if you go into the, uh, come down in the verse and stuff like that of just that one song you, you, just the sheer explosiveness of it and then going into the sort of um, somnibilic somnibilic sleepiness <laughs> of the groove yeah yeah uh, you, Rick mentions that um you know, very creative sound design, and I would say yes. That in fact, that's exactly what this music is. It's des sound designed music. It sounds like it could be in the back of a perfume commercial. The cliche elevator music sounds like it could be the kind of samples that you would get with some sort of MIDI program if you ordered one. Um, <laughs> you're not getting some sort of distinct, brilliant melody. You're getting a tasteful and well-produced sound. Um, he talks about the space in the music, the sound of it, how it's beyond its years. Um, I would say that Billie Eilish does have uh, a nice vocal style. Um, it's not a rock one though. I would say she's it's more similar to her sort of her namesake, Billie Holiday. It's this sort of smoky jazz uh, style. And I think she uses it well, um, but once again, if we're looking at the dynamics, like if you listen to a song like Strange Fruit, just the, um, maybe dynamics is the wrong word, I guess that's part of it, but just the intonation, inflection in Billie Holiday's vocals compared to an entire album's worth of vocals with Billie Eilish, uh, Billie Eilish has some nice, nice vocal tricks, but... Um, not even close to just just the first few bars of uh, Strange Fruit. Um, uh, Rick Beato goes on to talk about how it doesn't sound like music written by committee. I would disagree. I guess if you're really in tune to a, a particular songs that are written by committee and then you hear this, you might say, yeah, this is a little less formulaic, but only a little. You know, a song like... Um, Sliver, <laughs> it smells like teen spirit. Nobody thinks a committee came up with that, obviously. It sounds like it was created by a, um, some kind of a lunatic. This stuff sounds like, yeah, it, it could have been made by a committee. Um, it wasn't, but it, <laughs> if your ability as a songwriter is to make, by yourself, be able to make songs that sound like they were made in a boardroom, yeah, that... I don't know if that's necessarily a skill you'd want to brag about. So that's just my general thoughts on the video. Um, yes, her and her brother are very talented. They seem to work very hard. You can tell that they put a lot of thought into the music, a lot of work into it. It's The things that work on it aren't an accident, for sure. They, they definitely know what they're doing. But I would say it would be, at this point anyways, who knows what the future will bring, um, a triumph of craftsmanship over inspiration. Um, someone like Kurt Cobain had not only the spark of genius, but he had an explosion of it. I mean, there, there are just so many inspired moments in Nirvana songs where um, even when he follows a formula, I mean, he himself joked about that, the verse, chorus, verse thing. He came up with interesting verses, interesting choruses, interesting riffs, musical motifs that were distinct to him. Um, whether it's the All Apologies riff, the Negative Creep riff, <laughs> the School riff, you know, it, it just goes on and on and on. The amount of distinct musical ideas that whether or not the production was any good, whether he sang them well, any of that stuff, that idea lives on. 
Whereas I think if you were to divorce Billie Eilish's music from the good production and just focused on just the melody, um, it'd be pretty mundane. They're just they're just mundane melodies, and that, that that's it. A lot of them. Um, Rick talked about how you know there's these influences of the Beatles and stuff in there, and he played a song, and yeah, it sounded vaguely like the Beatles, but it kind of sounded like that sort of little foreshadowing thing that the Beatles would say, or uh, lots of artists do this, where you kind of get a hint of the mel melody before the real melody kicks in and it builds and goes on in different directions. That's what a lot of this stuff sounds like. It sounds like the foreshadowing of something to come that never happens. Or they sound like very pleasant instrumental interludes sandwiched in between nothing. You know, it's... A lot of indie rock music is a is a build up to nothing. This this stuff sounds like an interlude to nothing. Um, so if th if this is how, as Rick says, how to reinvent rock by making it tasteful, which basically means removing everything interesting from it and leaving just the tasteful bits, um, I I really don't think that's anything to get excited about. But anyways. Uh, I guess let me know what you think. That's my grouchy old man rant for today. <laughs>